Thank you. Let's get going. I've got a lot to cover and a load of slides. So let's get it on. So what is uncertainty? Uncertainty is that horrible feeling when you don't know what you're going to do next. Here's a formal definition. I'm not going to read it out. But it's when you don't know something. It's when you go, should I take that new job? Should I stay where I am? Which is the all right option? Should we build this feature? Should we not? When I talk about a lot of my examples are going to be software because that's what I've been doing for, as you'll find out in a minute, quite a long time. But uncertainty exists in every part of our lives. Should you buy that house? Should you date that partner? Whatever you're doing in life, there are choices we make. And most of them contain some part of uncertainty. So remember, it's not just about the software. But as I said, I'm going to focus really on software because that's how I think about uncertainty. So task-based. When you're a junior developer, the first question you generally ask, somebody says, implement this feature. And you go, uh, how do I do this? Um, as you get more senior, sometimes like, I've been asked to do this. Is it actually possible? Uh, a classic example for those that know NP complete. Sometimes you're given a thing to do and the answer is yes, in theory it can be done. In reality, you need more time than the lifetime of the universe to complete it. So the task is not feasible. What is the right way to implement this feature? Which way should we do it? These are all just little questions that we ask each other and ourselves every day. But also we have career-based. Should you take the job offer? What skill should you focus on? What, what should you be learning right now for the next 10 years? Is it, is it LLMs? Is the question everybody's asking right now. Or how do I get promoted? How do I get to the next step? As you go up in your career ladder, you'll find that the skills you need change. So you might not have the skills you need for the next level. Plus the rest of your life. All these decisions in life. So. Let's talk about uncertainty. Let's take, take a step back. When I talk about uncertainty, what do I mean? Uncertainty is about information. It's about what is in your head. And when you deal with information, it can be missing. You simply you don't know it or it's not known. It can be unreliable. Someone's told you that this is a safe bet, you should definitely take this job, but it might not be true. It can be conflicting. Have you ever had a job offer and then your current company's counter-offered? Now you've got two competing choices. Both people are going to tell you that you, that's where you should be. It can be noisy. You might have the information, but there might be noise within the information. Or it can just be downright confusing, and we'll come back to that a bit later. But one of the ones I want to talk about is temporal uncertainty. Time is a funny factor when it comes to uncertainty. Now, I started my career, well, I started my career 30 years ago, which tells you how old I am. I actually started university in 1993. So what was the world like in 1993? Some of us were there, I know, I'm not going to name names. This was cool tech. This was it. You know, a Nokia M100. That had a colour screen. And 128 by 128 display. Chip. You know, my language of choice, Ball and Delphi. Does anybody here remember Ball and Delphi? Wow, Okay. That's aged the audience quite a lot. Uh, sorry, guys. But look, Linux was less than three years old. Nobody was using it yet. In fact, my university, when I started in 1993, had two computers. We had two Sun machines, one for the undergradu under undergraduates and one for the postgraduates. No memory protection. You could take out the entire machine if you knew what you were doing as well. The World Wide Web was less than four years old. Nobody had the internet like we have now. Amazon doesn't exist yet. Agile? 
We're not even close to Agile yet. Waterfall is cool. <laughs> but my point here is like the stuff we did 30 years ago, the best practices we had 30 years ago are old hat now. So in your careers, if you're at the start of your career, you've got another 30 years ahead. What's it going to be like? You know, it could be 2053. I have literally no idea what the right technology is going to be at that point. I've got no idea what the machines are going to be using, what kind of software we're going to be building, whether LLMs are still going to be cool or not, or whether we've all been replaced by, you know, auto-generated code. Who knows? So let's move on to a career. Here's a career ladder. Um, well, Deck, later on, we'll talk you through different career ladders. This is just an example one. So don't read too much into this being the only career ladder. But generally, we start at the bottom, junior engineer, uh, what we call SDE1 and SDE2 now, software development engineer one and two, senior. And beyond senior, it gets a bit messy. Some people have staff, some people have other staff. Some people have levels. Microsoft has loads and loads of levels. Even within each band, you've got like tens, tons of levels. And then as you go up, you can go down the individual contributor track. You can go down the agile leadership track. You can go down the pure leadership track. Each of those divergent branches are all things that you might find that you want to do. You know, as you grow more senior, interesting things happen. So let's plot your seniority against uncertainty. As you get more senior, what happens? The uncertainty goes up. Right, this is the bad news. This is the whole bad news of the entire talk. For your entire career, uncertainty is going to be there. And as you get better at it, the uncertainty actually gets worse. But... It also changes. So as you go up through your career ladder, the problems you face change. Okay. We start at the bottom when we're, when we're a nice junior developer is often the how and what questions. As you get higher, it becomes the why questions. Because when you're a junior developer, you don't know what you're doing. Most of your questions are going to be about how do I do this? What should we be doing? How do I test it? All those kind of things. As you get senior, it's like, are we doing the right thing? Are we using the right technology? Are we using the right platform? Are we delivering the value that the customer needs? So you change from this technical uncertainty about features and implementation into uncertainty about what you're doing or why you're doing it. I always think it changes from what to why. Yeah. It's no longer you're told to implement a button. It's now what's the company direction, right? Or what technology, you know, you're, you're now a senior leader, technical leader in a company. For which technology, which language should you be betting on? 30 years ago, it might've been Ball and Delphi. But now what's, what's the language of choice? You know, no JS suddenly appeared, right? You know, pick your language, but each of those choices have trade-offs. So, I know this is the wrong way around, and it should go the other way, but it doesn't. So, think about these. The questions you might ask is like, how do I implement the button? How do I implement a feature? Does this feature make sense? Am I implementing the right feature? Are we using the right tools? Each level up, becomes more and more abstract. Do we have the right resources? As a senior leader, you'll often be worried about hiring rather than you might spend 20% of your time just on hiring people to deal with attrition, to deal with turnover, to deal with growth. And are we doing even the right thing? Now, when we talk, I talk about a lot about uncertainty, but there's three, there's a, a chaos triangle you need to be aware of. Here it is. Uncertainty, risk, and complexity. 
these three things. I'm going to talk mostly about uncertainty today, but actually when we talk about uncertainty, we need to talk about risk and complexity as well. Because these three factors affect each other. You increase the complexity, your uncertainty increases. The more complex your system, I dealt with a system uh, for many years, which had 10 million lines of code. The rate of change of that code was so high that you couldn't follow the change requests. Right? You couldn't read the number of changes that went on each day, which meant you could never get this overarching view of the code. You don't know the code. When you're, when you're at university, your code's this long. I know it. Right? My uncertainty level is very low. But as it gets bigger, my uncertainty gets higher. Right? I cannot reason about a system I cannot contain in my head. Well, you can, but it's hard. Right? And it, it increases the uncertainty. When you're dealing with risk, when you're dealing with systems that affect lives, right? how certain are you that your system is not going to blow up and kill someone? Right? If you're building control systems for nuclear reactors, you've got to control risk, you've got to control uncertainty, and you've got to control complexity. And each of these have the relations between them. So increasing one increases the others. Decreasing one decreases the others as well. But what's the worst thing you can do? What do people do when faced with uncertainty? Nothing. The most common reaction to not knowing what to do is to sit on your hands and do nothing. Who's done it? I've done it. Yeah. Pavel's done it. Yeah. Yeah, we do, right? It's a natural reaction. When you don't know whether to take decision A or decision B, a very common choice is to make no decision at all. Yeah. But it is the absolute worst thing you can do. You have doing nothing gives you no control. Right? You have no input into the outcome. Now, you might be lucky. You might sit on your hands, do nothing, and the problem goes away. Right? It becomes irrelevant. Right? The thing that you were asked to do that seemed impossible and you didn't know how to do, suddenly it's like, oh, that's, we've changed our minds. We're not doing that feature anymore. Uh, we've had a reorg. It's irrelevant. Um, you have no control of the risk. Right? Now, if you're lucky, it works out. If you're unlucky, it doesn't. It could cost you a lot of money or it could cost you your job. But you have no control over it. And I promise you, these things will blow up. You've, we've all done it. We've all left something for too long. You know, I tell you, if you don't answer a jury summons in time, it get, they, they, you get in trouble. Not that I've done that. What to do instead? Now, I'm going to say a bunch of things today that sound really simple, and it turns out that people don't do them. So let's go back to the basics. Recognize decision paralysis. Get used to noticing when you're avoiding making a decision. What we actually tend to do is uh, when you're at work and you don't know what to do, what do you do? You check your email and then you check the web and then you check Slack and then you check your email. Right? We do it, right? We do this cycle. We do this avoidance cycle of actually making a decision or doing something that's complex just by not doing it hard enough. Here's what you should do. First, what can I do to increase certainty? We're talking about uncertainty. So what can I do to increase certainty? And that is generally, we said, it's an information loss, right? We don't have enough information. So discover more information. Right? What is the key question you need to answer to make progress. And this can be going and asking your boss, what, why are we doing this? What, what's the goal? Uh, I actually did this with a feature. My boss came to me, he had spoken to his boss, and he was like, we need to implement this thing. And I'm like, okay. What he turned out by asking the right questions is, I saved six months worth of work. Why? Because he said, oh, we need this for research. We need this to do, to do this feature. And it turned out that the researchers didn't need this feature. They weren't going to use it. So 
for those first three months, we didn't need it. If the research was successful, so this research project we were working on was successful, then they would spin up a team to build a product. Now, I wouldn't be building the product, so I don't need to build it either. So the thing they wanted to build and were very excited about building was completely irrelevant. It had add, added actual no business value. So ask the right questions. Do, do the discovery. You might also need to do spikes. So one of the questions, especially in software, is, is this actually feasible? Can it be done? And often you cannot tell from outside. You actually need to go and try it. And in fact, trying it, doing a spike, building something, is a form of discovery. Now, you've done a little bit of work and do this cyclically. Think about agile processes, right? You do this cyclically. Find, discover some information, look at it. What's the risk reward trade-off? Do I dump it? Do I keep doing it? What do I do? Make a decision, step forward. And do it. Do whatever that thing is, those small steps, each time reducing the uncertainty from discovering information. Keep repeating. Now, but what happens when you reach a situation where you can't increase certainty anymore? Right? In some situations, you'll end up with two choices. You can't get any more information. Uh, the classic example for me is 18 months ago, I was offered a new job. I was counter-offered. I had two offers on the table. I had all the information they were willing to give me about those offers. But I had temporal uncertainty. You know, both offers look good right now. What was going to happen in three years' time? Would I, can, I, can, I, can I gain any more information? The answer is no. So often you'll find there is no more information to have. So assess the risks. Those two choices, what are the risks? Well, the worst case for me at that point, if I took the job and it didn't work out, I'll quit. I have enough faith in my own skills and a broad enough skill set that if I quit, if it didn't work out, I'm going to lose six months. It's not great, but it's also not the end of the world. So I knew the risks and I knew the potential upsides. Honestly, you're going to have to place a bet. At some point, you're going to have to pay the piper. You're going to have to put your money on the table and place a bet based on your best estimate of which, which is going to be successful. And uh, Jennifer later on will be talking about handling failure. You will fail. Some choices you make, you're like, did I make the right choice? I don't know. I'll probably never know. Okay. Choices are like that. You don't have all the information even afterwards. But you have to move forward. Right. You have to make choices. You have to move forward. There's no point sitting on your hands and hoping it all goes away. It does eventually. Give it 50 or so years and it will become none of us will care anymore. But you will fail. The trick, poker players know they will lose. Right. If you actually are a professional, I, I, a friend of mine is a professional poker player. And what he says is, you don't win all the time. The whole point of being great at poker is to sway the odds towards you. Some days, it doesn't matter how good you are, you will still lose. The cards will go against you. But on average, he wins. So think about it that way. You're, play, you're, 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 you're not fixing the odds. You're not determining the outcome. You're swaying the odds towards your decision. And honestly, when you make a decision... Did I make the right decision? Sometimes you know, sometimes you're like, yes, I got that right. And sometimes you don't. Sometimes you come out the end and you go, did I make the right decision? I don't know. I made a choice. And those choices in your career, do you go into management? Do you go into, do you stay an individual contributor? Both choices have trade-offs. I've done a bit of both. What I did is I, I spent a bit of time doing management and actually, I found I prefer like small management, right? Team lead, tech lead, great. People manager, I can do it, but I'm not 
great at it. And it's not, it's not the thing I enjoy doing. I enjoy the technical solving problems. And I, I enjoy, as a more senior technologist, helping people solve technical problems. And that might be at bigger and bigger scales. Right? I now consult with other people in the company. It's like, can we solve this? What do we do? I know I'm running out of time, but I want to, I want to step back and step back into my world of software development. So in software development, most of the things you do, most of the, the things we do are about reducing uncertainty and complexity. So think about test driven development. Why do we do test driven development? Because I want to know the code will still do the same thing tomorrow. I want to know I've covered all the cases, right? What I don't want is to be called at three in the morning when the system blows up. Great. Code reviews and pairing. We make mistakes. We're human. That's part of, part of the way our brains work. So code reviews and pairing help us reduce the problem space. But bigger stuff, what about functional programming? Functional programming is going to attack on complexity. He said, attack on uncertainty. Right? It says, well, all these things I can control, right? Let the compiler do the work and guarantee that what I said is what I wanted to do. Chaos engineering, somebody mentioned this last night. Chaos engineering is about saying, well, I've got this system, I believe it's correct. Let's go poke the bear. What happens if I kill an in, a random server in my system? Does the system continue to function? It's frightening when you first try it, right? The first time you try chaos engineering and you take out a, one of your Kubernetes pods and your system does weird things. I guarantee it. If you've never done chaos engineering, the first time you do it, your system will fall over in catastrophic ways <laughs> because you've never tested that thing. But it's a lot of fun. And once you've done it a few times, what happens, right? Once I have Chaos Engineer running in the background, my system's being randomly smashed with a hammer and it doesn't break. How much certainty have I got in my system stability? A lot, because I've actually tried it. Agile development. Again, agile development, think about this. I'm trying to get from the start to the end. In the old days of waterfall, we said, we're going this way. And if you've got the direction wrong, you're going to end up somewhere else. What do we do in agile? Well, I went the wrong way. Oh, okay. Uh, right, let's try this way. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Right. You know, each time, for oh, these animations are a bit slow. Each time you make a, a, an iteration, a cycle, you are course correcting. Right? You're reducing uncertainty. The uncertainty at the start is huge. As I get further on, the uncertainty is lowering. Until hopefully I actually achieve a useful business goal rather than building something which is broken and, and cost a million dollars. So how do you handle uncertainty? Work to reduce the uncertainty. That's it. There's no, there is no magic secret here. Right? What you need to do, though, is actually actively be aware that there is uncertainty and, you'll hand, and you have to handle it. Right? Make positive choices that reduce the uncertainty. Understand the risk of getting it wrong. If the risk of getting it wrong is someone dies, you need to be really certain. Right? When you're dealing with life-threatening systems or, or life-affecting systems, you need to be really certain it's going to be right. And what do we do? We use specialist languages. We work really hard. We do a lot more work to ensure the system is safe. If the answer is it blows up, uh, I run a personal website. If it blows up, nobody cares. Probably nobody will notice, let alone nobody cares. So it doesn't matter if I blow up a release, right? And it roll it out and it's broken. Eh, nobody cares. Learn the context, learn about the business, learn what's important. If you don't know what's important, you can't assess the risk. Eat the frog. Um, eating the frog is, is the thing. If you have to eat a frog today, you might as well just get it over with. So do the thing that makes you most uncomfortable at the start of the day. And then you don't have to worry about it all day. I know I do this. I do this. I have a task that I'm avoiding. Um, honestly, have a daily to-do list because I find that when I copy tasks from my to-do list into the next day and the next day and the next day, I know that I'm avoiding that task. Long-term uncertainty. Sharpen the saw, increase your skills, 
go broad and deep. So T-shaped skill sets is what a lot of people talk about, which is I have one skill where I'm an expert, but I have a lot of broad skills. I know a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of the other. And it'll help you with why new thing. Work, work your network. LinkedIn, you'll see my profile at the end. Hit me up. Great. Find people in your space. Your company might blow up. Your company you work for might blow up tomorrow. I've seen it happen. I've seen people made redundant. Great. And it's nothing to do with you. It's to do with the macro environment. Build a buffer. I know if you have talked to any financial advisor, they say build a buffer. What happens if you are made redundant tomorrow? Great. Or worse than that, the company blows up. You're not made redundant. There's just no money. You don't get paid. Having a little bit of buffer will make your life easier. It reduces your uncertainty on the macro scale. Oh, learn the context again. Ah, I've copied bits from uh, the other to-do list. Keep a research log. Uh, so daily task lists and research logs. Keep a history of what you've done and what decisions you've made and why. It's really useful when you go back. So in conclusion, uncertainty is always here. Right? It is a part of life, every part of life, your work, your life, your home life. Get used to it. Work to increase certainty and think about the short and the long term. And that's it.